is this number bigger or smaller than K? Are you guys really just that good with bigger and smaller numbers, or am I just that bad? You guys seem to come up with that really, really fast. Yeah, I'm still just bad at it. I always get it confused. So if you ask for help, be aware that I get those bigger, smaller things messed up every so often. So we're looking at Q being 10 to the minus 12, which is a really small number. Let's see your hand. Give me a sec. Which is now smaller than K, which means which direction should our reaction favor? We should form products. Slide up that answer. And we should be getting that. Yes, what was your question? Um, for the, you wrote 10, it's 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the negative 6 there. But in the original case, Good like call. Yep. Another common mistake. Anybody know what that common mistake is? Control C, Control V. Um, was the rest of the numbers correct in that? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, hopefully you won't make that mistake because you won't be doing control copy, okay, um, when you go through and solve these problems. Make sure that you get your exponential values correct. I intentionally throw these in so you can see where the mistakes are, right? Let's just stick with that, okay? Next problem. Are they both? The 10 to the negative 12 is right though, right? I believe so, yeah. The answer was actually correct. I punched it into the calculator, correct, yeah? Or actually, what, were all your numbers right on that? Really? Is that what you're supposed to say if you got it right? Yeah, there we go. Hey, okay. So with the next question, sorry, I just wanted to see if you're all were following along. We can go through and do it again. This notation is slightly different. We shouldn't have had that giant space when we look at C. That was kind of my fault. I think that's just an editing error. Um, that equals actually goes all the way across. So we're saying the concentration of carbon monoxide equals the concentration of chlorine, which equals 1.48 times 10 to the minus 6. Punch all the numbers into the calculator, and we should end up with that expression. What was your question? Um, say if you didn't have the concentration of uh, CO, could you go ahead and solve for it? Because you have the concentration of uh, K. Uh, no, because you don't know that you're at equilibrium. If you knew you were at equilibrium, yes, and we will see that problem for sure later today. I definitely have time to get into that. All right. We go through, punch all the numbers in, and we get 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 10. Are we looking at Q or K? Okay, that's not exactly 2.19 times 10 to the minus 10. Pretty close. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, we would say that's effectively a rounding error, and we are looking at K. Which way does our reaction shift? Doesn't. Okay, does that mean the reaction stops? The no shaking is a good option. Remember, at equilibrium, the reaction is still performing. It just means the reaction forward equals the reaction reverse. So our reaction is still actually occurring. We're just not increasing or decreasing concentration of our products or reactants. Okay? So it's a very dynamic, static situation. Yes? Good call. Officially, we are looking at Q as well because it's the same idea. We would define Q better as K in this circumstance because we're at the equilibrium. But yeah, you're right. Questions on solving those? Oh, I think I got a sneeze. But it's not coming. Okay. So, our reactions at equilibrium, no shift. Any questions with this? Okay. So, we could go back to Le Chatelier's principle. Same general idea that we already talked about. If it's at equilibrium, it's going to want to stay at equilibrium. Okay, so if we disturb it, so if we've got our closed system that's at equilibrium, and then we go up and poke it, okay, point at it, laugh at it, throw stuff at it, it's now going to get disturbed and shift to account for that disturbing. 
Okay? Our standard ways of disturbing it aren't laughing or poking, but changing our concentration, changing our pressures, or changing our temperatures. So if we make a change to any one of those three, the equilibrium is going to change to account for that, or our reaction is going to change the direction uh, to account and re-achieve equilibrium. Okay, so we'll look at a problem with that. So that was our easy way of saying it. So if we switch it around a little bit. So this was C. We were at equilibrium. So now that we're at equilibrium, I'm going to go through and mess with it. I'm going to double the concentration of the COCl2. So all we're going to do is now, instead of it being 0.01, I'm going to make it 0.02 what happens? What goes down? We plug in our numbers and our Q value changes. Are we at equilibrium now? No. So now we're evaluating Q, not K anymore. Which way does our reaction shift? If Q is now, what is that? That's a smaller number, right? Like I said, I'm bad with it. Q smaller than K, what happens? We get a, isn't that rightward facing? Yeah. We get the forward reaction. Our product concentration would increase. Our reactant concentration would decrease. So what did the reaction do to account for that change? We increased the concentration of our reactant to reach equilibrium. What did it do? It increased the product concentration by decreasing the reactant concentration. So what it did was shift to account for that difference. That's ultimately what Le Chatelier's principle is looking at. It goes back to the mathematics and says, okay, with this Q and K relationship, what happens when we tweak and adjust it? So if we were going to push this a little bit further, what happens if we went through and changed the product concentration? Let's say we increased the carbon monoxide concentration. What's going to happen? We'll equal Q again. Should the Q value be greater than or less than K if we increase carbon monoxide? If this number goes up, Q becomes bigger than it was initially, which means Q becomes greater than K. What happens if Q is bigger than K? We see the reverse reaction occur, and our reactant concentration go up, and our product concentrations go down to account for that. While I was up at Scottsdale, someone came up with a nice little picture. Oh, this is all the steps. Okay, before we even look at this, let's go ahead, come up with kind of a dynamic picture for this. If we look at a reaction, so this is kind of a a good way to approximate it. We'll connect two chambers. We'll have two chambers. This will be our reactant chamber. Ooh, I can write better than that, I promise. We've got, I can write better with a pen. Our reactants, and we'll have a second chamber with our products in it. Are reactants and products linked? Yeah, if we increase the concentration or we add reactants to a solution, what happens? The reaction actually progresses forward. What happens to the concentration of the reactants? Decreases, and what happens with the products? Increase. So there is a direct connection between these. So let's go ahead and tunnel through at the bottom of this and show that connection. So these two chambers are now connected to each other. So now what we're going to do is say, okay, let's add some reactants. Our reactants are going to be water. So I add water into my reactant chamber. Let's say I add enough. Okay, we'll close off our reaction. We won't let it start. We add in a whole bunch of water. 
Now we say reaction go. Right? No, no one's going to say reaction go for me. Okay. Yay, there we go. What happens? What happens to the level of the water in our reactant chamber? It goes down. Where does it go? Over to the products. Until what happens? Our product concentration goes up, and what we end up with is a situation I tried to erase with my finger there. That doesn't work. We would end up with a situation like this, where the water level in each sample was at the same height. We are now at equilibrium. There's water going both towards the products and towards the reactants in both cases. Let's move to Le Chatelier. Let's add more reactants. What happens? If we add more reactants in here, we fill this up a little bit more. What happens? More, some water drops down. This water level goes up until we reach a new equilibrium. So there's a slightly different color. New equilibrium. Does that make sense? What happens if instead of doing that, instead of adding reactants, wow, there's a lot of drawing in there, I added more products. So I added some stuff to that side. Okay, our water is going to push down a little bit, and this is going to go up. Our reactant concentration increases. Okay, until we reach yet again a new equilibrium. The constant will stay the same. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but our numbers end up changing. The amount of reactants and products are still different. Okay? But our constant, the relationship between those stays the same. So that's adding. Is there another way we could have done this? I'll have to make these lines a little bit taller. What if instead of adding stuff to it, start our new equilibrium up here, I take reactants away. So now my situation is that I've got a level down here. How does the equilibrium shift to account for that removal? The product water is going to have to decrease so that we can fill up the reactants and account for that loss. Kind of make sense? Well, it's a nice little pictorial way to represent what's going on with this. So we've seen some mathematics. We've seen some admittedly beautiful pictures. <clears throat> now what we'll do is kind of look at some of the other principles. What are these disturbances? So when we look at concentration, we already evaluated this. Right? That's because that's the standard. That's the one I like working with the most is our concentration. So we already know how increasing and decreasing concentrations can change our equilibrium constant, or sorry, change our Q value, which then our equilibrium will then shift to account to get back to equilibrium. All right? What about pressure? Well, we've already kind of discussed this. Pressure and concentration are directly re related through the gas law. Okay, so we could go back to the gas law. We could re-derive, because I'm pretty sure we already did this derivation. And we can see that pressure and concentration are related. So that if we go through and change the pressure, it's effectively the same thing, or all the same rules apply as if we were changing the concentration. Exact same idea, right? Is that a right? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. Temperature is a little bit different. We did talk about it uh, earlier because we looked at how temperature can affect our equilibrium. Now we're going to look at it a little bit more carefully. So we can go back to Hess's law stuff from 151, and we could use the heat term as either a reactant or a product. Okay, how do we know whether our heat is a reactant or a product? What would we have to look for? So exothermic or endothermic would show up in your uh, problem. Ultimately, that exothermic or endothermic can be represented another way. Not with words, but with, mm, yes, enthalpy change, and I think someone said it over here, the sign on our heat term. If our heat term is negative, what does that mean? It's an exothermic reaction. I don't know if I actually put something here. Okay. So we could say 
if we were looking at our exothermic, I'll color code it, so we've got our reactants going to products. If we have an exothermic reaction, we would expect a negative sign on our change in enthalpy, which means heat is a product, which means we go back to our balanced equation, and we would say heat shows up on our, the product side of our equation. So if we go back to that beautiful drawing that I had, if we increase the heat on an exothermic reaction, which way does the equilibrium shift? Let me face the way you guys are going. No, nope, that's not going to matter. If we increase the heat, we're increasing the concentration of our products, which means to achieve equilibrium, what do I need to do? I need to go left. So you were right, sorry. We want to reduce the concentration or our defect, okay? Our, what did I call it? A disturb, disturb that D word. Okay. Disturbance. Disturbance, thank you. Okay, and we would shift towards our reactions. What happens if we decrease the heat of our reaction? We need to account for that loss of heat, so we're going to start to form more products, just like we would with our reactant concentrations and pressures. What if it was an endothermic reaction? What would our sign be? We would see a positive value. Now, would, where would our heat term show up? As a reactant. So what we can do when given either exothermic, endothermic, or our changes in enthalpy as positives and negatives, we can add the heat term to our balanced equation. Do we need to know what the number is? No. Okay, Because when we calculate our Q and K, that number never shows up. We don't put the heat term into it. All we really need to know is where is that heat? Is it a reactant or a product? And now if we change it in any direction, what is your ultimate result? Okay. So we aren't quantifying that change. All we're doing is looking at the magnitude of it. Does that make sense? So I believe we're looking at uh, almost. This is kind of a summary of everything. So if we look at our concentrations, increase the concentration of reactant our reaction is going to shift to consume that increase. So to do that, we have to make products. If we go through and do pressure, it's the same idea as our concentration. When we look at temperature, what we're going to do is first decide where that heat term should show up, either as a product or as a reactant. Once we know that, we can treat it the exact same as we would with our concentrations or our pressures. Kind of make sense? Um, one thing I do kind of want to be careful with here. Pressure can be a bit tricky. One of the things that we put in that statement was the partial pressure must change. Why do we have to look at the partial pressure? So when we're looking at an individual reaction, so we're going to say a reaction is occurring down in here. We've got react, whoops, blue is a bad color for that. Reactants in equilibrium with our products. As this reaction occurs, we put, have the potential for our pressures of these species to be detected okay, and ultimately change. We don't want to look necessarily at the total pressure because I want the concentration of just this species. So when we go back to the ideal gas law, it's just that species to get our concentration. So when we go through and determine our pressures, we want just the pressure of that one species because that's how it relates back to our concentrations. Kind of make sense? Yeah? If it's in an enclosed chamber, how do you get pressure just that? So there are ways to determine that experimentally. Thankfully, we don't have to determine that experimentally. What would we do? just get told that information. So, um, Other ways that you can approach it, if you're told the total pressure of the system and you know everything's in the gas phase, so let's say the pressure in here was one atmosphere. What's the partial pressure of each of those? Total pressure is equal to what? Good answer on the one. 
Not what I was looking for, though. And I think someone say it here. It's equal to the pressures of everything in there, the sum of the pressures of everything else. Because I said it was one. Yeah. We can go back to the balanced equation and say, at least in the one I've got shown here, that it's one to one, which means I can say my partial pressures are equivalent. Okay? So we can kind of cheat to get those values out of it. And you will have to do that in the homework. When it comes to the exam, I don't think that's an extra step that's worth testing you on. So I'll tell you directly what those pressures are. I'll give you the partial pressures. Um, let's see, did I put it as another question? Okay, how can we change the pressure okay, in our picture? So this is ultimately why it's important to look at the partial pressure. If I want to increase the pressure in here, what could I do? What's that? We can move this piston. So good on you on realizing that that was a piston. I did a good job drawing. We can move that piston downwards. What does that do to the space here? Decreases the volume. So our volume decreases. What would that do to the pressure? The pressure increases. So that means the partial pressure of each of these species also increases. So if we change the volume, that does change the pressure. So we can change other things that don't seem to be concentration or pressure. So we see how that relates to pressure, but does it also relate to concentration? How do you calculate the concentration of A? What are your units on concentration? Okay, way to jump to the full answer I was going for, but we would say molarity first, and then the one I really wanted was moles per <coughs> liter. What are liters units of? Volume. volume. If I decrease the volume, what happens to my molarity? Increases. It's an inverse relationship. If the liter value gets smaller, the molar value gets bigger. So changing the volume, both in a gas phase and in solution phase, does change the concentration or our partial pressures. How would we change the volume in solution? In pressure, it makes sense. We just change the size of the container. But if we change the size of the container with a solution, does that really change the volume? Solution's a liquid. It's going to take up whatever volume it's in. That doesn't change our reactant concentrations. How do we change the volume for a solution? we could add more solvent. When we're looking at a gas, when we change the volume, we're changing the space in which our gas occupies. Okay? If we're looking at a liquid, we're saying our compound is dissolved in that liquid. That's its space. So what we want to do is change the volume of the liquid that's containing it. So if we increase the amount of solvent, what happens to our concentration? Increase our liter value, what happens to the molarity? decreases. Okay, so volume changes can affect our concentrations and our pressures. They're just slightly different circumstances to force it. When we're looking at the standard way to change our volumes, we're looking typically in our gas phase, and we're looking for volume differences by a, a piston moving effectively. When we move to solution phases, we change our volumes by changing the amount of solvent that's dissolving our compound. As far as you guys are concerned, what solvent do we use? We always use water. That's our standard uh, in Gen Chem. Any idea why we use water? It's a universal solvent. What's that? It's a universal solvent. Why is it a universal solvent? It's cheap, abundant, and non-toxic. One of the primary, or those are the primary reasons we use water for a lot of our reactions. Okay. It's also relatively non-reactive in most circumstances that we would deal with. Okay. Questions on looking at pressure changes. How to make sense where those are coming from? Let's test you on it. Okay. We got a big long problem here with now all sorts of little parts to it. 
consider the equilibrium where delta H is greater than zero. First thing I would do, what does that mean? Yes, you're actually taking it a step further than I would. Delta H greater than zero. Delta H is positive. I know, it's really simple. Everybody goes, oh, I would never forget that. Take an exam. Tell me you'll never forget that after you take the exam. Okay? So write that information down. Delta H greater than zero, it's positive, which means now we can add in the endothermic. The next conclusion from that, I would then go back to my reaction and say heat is on the left-hand side of that reaction. Okay. So now I've got a balanced reaction that takes into consideration heat, which presumably means when we get through into these questions, heat's going to show up. We'll do some tweak on the temperature. How will the following changes affect the equilibrium mixture? Okay, so if we're concerned about how it's going to affect the equilibrium mixture, what's another piece of information that might be useful to solve these? If we're at equilibrium, what is true? K equals Q and Q, or sorry, K equals... Thank you. So K equals the concentration of our products over the concentration of our reactants. Okay, so let's come up with an equation on this. I'm going to do this a bit long in this circumstance and show you one of the earlier things that I just told you to take for granted earlier. What are our products? <coughs> Titanium chloride. Our reactants. Titanium and chlorine. Chlorine to the second power because of the coefficient. So we could officially write this out. Before we say this is valid, there's a couple things we want to address. What are our phases? Okay, we've got all sorts of different phases in this, so we've got to be careful. What did we say at the very beginning when we first looked at equilibrium? What phases can show up? Gases and not liquid. It's a different phase. Aqueous, it must be a solution. Liquid is a different phase. Okay? Which means, effectively, our equilibrium expression is going to be equal to 1 over the concentration of the chlorine squared. Why can we ignore our titanium chloride and our titanium? Okay, so I told you already that you, just, you can take them out. What's the concentration of a liquid? Pure. Okay. In the course of a reaction, as long as there's liquid there, that concentration doesn't change, which means this term is effectively a constant. Well, K is a constant as well, so let's group the titanium chloride with K. We'll do the same thing with the titanium, and we would get the expression that <coughs> 1 over the concentration of chlorine equals K... Make sure I do the math right. Concentration of titanium over the concentration of titanium chloride. What did we say the concentration of titanium was? Did it change? No, which means it's a constant. What happens when we multiply a constant by a constant? You get a constant. What about the titanium chloride? Does its concentration effectively change? No, so it's also a constant. Constant times a constant is, yet again, another constant. We summarize that all and say it's K. So when we go through and solve for the equilibrium, that equilibrium constant, this value, can incorporate multiple different things into it. And as long as it stays constant, we don't care. Kind of make sense? So let's actually stepwise through this now. I did sort of step some of this in. We've got our K. It's now 1 over the concentration of chlorine gas. So let's go through and see how these things change it. Let's go ahead 
and add elemental titanium. So what are we adding? We're going to be adding, increasing, whoops, that's an eraser, increasing the concentration of titanium solid. Does titanium solid show up in your equilibrium expression? No. So if we change that concentration, does it affect it? No. So never mind. Let's go back. Um, what happens if we heat the mixture? What are we doing if we add heat? <sighs> Come on. Stop it. If we add heat to the reaction, we're saying it's ultimately coming in as a reactant because that's where it shows up in our balanced equation. If we add the heat, which way does our equilibrium shift? Oh, that is the right. Sorry, it's looking backwards. It's going to shift to form our products. Okay. Heat is part of... Oh, I keep doing that. If we wanted to, we could go through and add it into our equilibrium expression so that we had an idea on where it was. 1 over whoops, Cl2 over the concentration of our heat. Okay. If we increase the heat term, we end up getting Q. Q would be what size? Smaller or bigger than K? Smaller, which way does our equilibrium shift? towards our products. Okay. Kind of get the idea so we can go back to all of those quantifications looking at Q and K. What happens if we add an inert gas to the reaction? It's not coupled to that. Okay, this one's actually kind of tricky. Let's assume it's an ideal gas first. We just add some other random gas to this. Does that affect my equilibrium constant? Let's add helium. Let's give you an inert gas to add. Is helium involved in the reaction? No. Is it involved in the equilibrium expression? What happens when you add the inert gas? Nothing. Okay. You said yes, right? Why did you say yes? Okay. Indirectly, yes. When we add an inert gas and we assume an ideal gas law, that gas comes in with what volume? Anybody remember from your ideal gas laws? <clears throat> no, you're coming up with a mole to volume ratio. What's one of the assumptions that you make in an ideal gas law? Every gas particle takes up zero volume. So when we add an inert gas, the volume doesn't change. Let's pretend we are all gas particles. Okay? As we add more people into the room, does the volume change? Okay. So where you're sitting right now, let's bring in another 1,000 people. Do you feel more cramped or less cramped? More cramped. Does the volume change? absolutely does change, okay? Because you feel more cramped. Look at the comparison. If I stand in this one space, I've got all of this arm room. As far as my volume goes, I've got a lot of space to be happy. I now add a billion people in here. Would I be able to swing my arms like this? No, I'd probably actually be pressed into a tiny little dot, okay? The volume that I now have to occupy is much, much smaller. So when we look at the ideal gas law, the assumption that we make is that I take up no volume. So if I bring in a billion people, it doesn't matter. I still have the same space, same types of interactions. This is why the ideal gas law fails. Particles do take up space. Okay? So that if we push uh, the gas law to an extreme, if we add a whole lot of particles into it, what we end up doing is do effectively re reduce the volume. If the volume decreases, does that change the concentration? <coughs> yes. So under ideal gas circumstances, 
an inert gas has no effect because it doesn't take up a volume. That's why it's an ideal gas. When it's no longer an ideal gas, that particle or that assumption is invalid, which means our particles do take up space. If our particle does take up space, what happens to the volume? The volume must go down. If the volume goes down, what happens to the concentration of chlorine? It increases. If our chlorine concentration gets bigger, what happens to Q? Decreases. Q is now less than K. Which way does our equilibrium shift? Towards our... I keep getting confused with this. Should shift away from it. Q less than K, right? It's going to shift to form products. Okay? That inert gas question is extremely tricky. Okay? When should you assume it's ideal? When should you assume it's not ideal? When I tell you. Okay? Ultimately, because that is so tricky to look at it as a real gas, and ultimately when you go through and look at gas laws, when you did all those calculations, how many of you actually remember seeing the Van der Waals expression? Two or three of you? Any ideas why only two or three of you saw it? Because it's more complicated and way too difficult to teach at this level. Okay? So what we typically deal with is the ideal gas law. You need to be aware of that assumption because that does cause our expressions to change, our results to change. That would be an example of an A-level question. Okay? If we change the pressure, okay, if we double the pressure, without actually stating how we're changing the pressure, we would have to assume what we're doing is increasing, the, effectively increasing the concentration of chlorine by doubling the pressure. Okay? The only way that we would see our pressure changing without um, changing our... That's a lie. If you increase the pressure, you're increasing it, period. Okay? So don't worry about that one. So if you increase the pressure, what happens? Chlorine concentration increases, which means what happens to our number at the end? Decreases. Q is less than K, meaning... Again, we form more products. Okay? Get the idea of dealing with Le Chatelier and all of that? It's a fun question to ask. Why is it a fun question to ask? How many calculator mistakes can you make during this one? Absolutely none. Okay? Which is why I'll typically ask questions like that. I like these because I don't have to worry about you making a dumb calculator mistake and now losing all your points and failing the class. Okay? So be aware these types of questions will show up frequently. Um, this question is going to become important when we move into the next chapter. We'll kind of go through it fast. Um, I adjusted this example question to kind of reflect uh, a little bit better what you would expect to balance for your equations. Okay? So remember when we talked about it yesterday, it was kind of confusing what equations to use for what. One equivalent of water will naturally decompose to form hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion. What does that mean? That means I take one molecule of H2O when I go through the balance. Why do I only take one? Because it says one equivalent. Decomposes to form hydrogen ion, known as H plus and OH minus. What is the equilibrium constant of this reaction if the concentration of hydroxide at equilibrium is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar? So we could go through and come up with an equilibrium expression. K equals products over reactants. What are our products? What are our reactants? Let's add in some phases here to help out with this. 
what phase would we assign to H2O? We could say aqueous, but does that really make sense? Does it really make any sense to say water is dissolved in water? That's a bit silly. So we'd add liquid. What does that mean happens to our equilibrium expression? All we're looking at is the concentration of H plus times concentration of OH minus. How do we solve for the equilibrium constant? We know the concentration of hydroxide is 10 to the minus 7. Do I know the concentration of H plus? How did I form hydroxide? Where did it come from? Water. In the process of forming that hydroxide ion, what else must I form? Hydrogen ion. If I form 10 to the minus 7 molar concentration of OH minus, what did I form of the H plus? 10 to the minus 7. I can plug those two numbers in. What we're using is our balanced equation to solve. And we get 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the minus 7, which gives us 10 to the negative 14, also known as the KW, incredibly important later on. So this comes back to that same rule, uh, only the same phases in your equilibrium expression. So we're looking at aqueous with aqueous, gas with gas. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there. I will warn you, tomorrow is a lot of calculations. All right. So at this point, we delayed as long as we possibly could on solving things. Tomorrow's going to be a lot of it. All right?